An identity crisis can be many things. Losing your sense of purpose, a midlife crisis, returning to civilian life, or simply feeling like you don't belong. My life has been one ongoing identity crisis after another. I've started this podcast to help deal with my own demons and negative self-talk, and to ultimately, and hopefully, learn that I'm not alone, and that these thoughts and feelings aren't unique to me. So if this helps you too, then one by one we can come together, heal ourselves, and move forward with our goals and dreams with a sense of belief, happiness, and purpose. Welcome back to the Identity Crisis Podcast. I'm Jay Newt, and today my guest is personal trainer, Mr. Tree Tran. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well, Jay Newt. How are you? I'm very, very well, buddy. Very well indeed. Now, tell me, in the in the world of personal training, you must come across a lot of people who uh, not only want to get healthy and better themselves, but probably a lot of people who have gone through some form of uh, imposter syndrome or depression or something in their life which has made them unhappy and they want to have a, a, a different change in their life, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, I have, uh, and yeah, I've, I've come across a lot of people like that. How common? How common do you think it really is? Well, I, I think when we start talking about people setting goals and achieving uh, things like that, it's it's quite common because I guess a lot of the times the goals that people set is things that they've never, I guess, uh, achieved before or even have much experience in. So then, when they start to embark on those things, imposter syndrome comes up a lot. So uh, to answer your question, it comes up a lot. So when it, when it comes up, I mean, because let's face it, you know, we all can suffer from this at, at any stage of our lives, no matter how old we are, what gender we are, what race we are. How often do you feel, or how often does it come up? And what are some of the, the common things that people say as far as resistance or not believing they can do something? Well, in, in the, well, so in PT, personal training, it comes up a little bit, but it's more so in my coaching, as you would know, I'm within Mantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's more around the guys who are trying to achieve something more um, outside of a uh, a physique or a performance goal, but more of a, a bigger goal. And something that I guess I try to explain a lot is a lot of the a lot of the times the imposter syndrome is coming from us. So it's sort of like if you're doing a routine or something and you make a mistake, nine times out of ten you're the only one who feels like that. But as you know, that can be quite crippling. Uh, so does that answer your, does that answer your question or? Yeah, it, it does. And actually, you've actually said something really poignant there. As you say, it can feel very crippling. I mean, sometimes I say that depending on how severe it is that you feel it, it can actually be debilitating where it doesn't just lead to you thinking, oh, I suck at this. It can actually lead to somebody going, I suck at this so much and I've got so little doubt in me. I'm just not going to bother at all. Yes, a hundred percent. And it's really sad. Well, for me, not sad, but as a coach, I really dislike seeing it, and then it's just human nature. But a lot of the times, these people are, you know, they're so accomplished and they've got so many credentials, and they 100% can do what they want to do. But just that imposter syndrome and feeling like they're not good enough, it, it stops them in their tracks before they even start. So it's something that I come up against a lot as a coach, mm-hmm. and it's something that I guess. I have to try and coach people through and it's more of a mindset perspective I feel to help to to change for that person to be able to go okay so I can do this. What what do you think is one of the most common reasons why people have imposter syndrome as you say a lot of these people can be quite accomplished in their lives but why do mm-hmm. you think it is that through PT for example or through coaching to better their lives why do you feel it it always crops up there? I, I think it's comparison. So a lot of people, when they start to embark on something, they start looking what other what other people are doing, how they're doing it, all that sort of stuff, which I think is good, but not if you're comparing your chapter one to someone's chapter 10. You know what I mean? Even so, as a coach, I, it happened to me a lot when I first started coaching is I was thinking, you know, who, who am I to even do this? You know, but then I've had 10, well, from a PT perspective, 
I've been trained since I was 17. I'm 42 now, but in terms of coaching, I've been coaching for about 10 years, but it still comes up. And for me, the times when it comes up is when I compare myself or I start looking around to see what other people are doing. So the biggest thing I advise is just to, to people is set a goal, know what your goal is, know what the plan is, and just execute the plan and just focus on yourself. You know, it's quite cliche, but it's always like me versus me or try to better to try to beat the version of yourself yesterday, even if it's 1%. And I truly believe that because no matter who you are, how accomplished, how successful you are, there's always going to be someone out there that is better than you um, in whatever field you're doing. So there's no, it, it's a stupid thing to do and it's pointless to compare yourself because there's always going to be somebody who's better than you. That's just human nature. I mean, that's just humans. That's That's how it is. But then at the same time, you're also going to be better than somebody else. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's always going to be someone above you, someone below you, and someone unequal to you. So that's a really big um, – so I'm going off topic a little bit, but I just want to share that because one of the uh, – I don't know, a method or a, a methodology that I like to teach is the plus minus equal method and that sort of like if you're moving along or you're trying to achieve a goal – you kind of need to have a plus, which is somebody who's sort of like your mentor. You need an equal who's sort of like a peer to you, who's traveling along the same path as you. And a minus is somebody who you're also helping and pulling along. I kind of feel that's sort of like the full circle of learning or progression. That actually makes a lot of sense. And it's actually a very simple analogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a firm, firm, firm believer on that. And I, I don't think I'm super successful, but whatever success I've had or in terms of knowledge or gaining more knowledge, I've adopted that philosophy and it's just put, it's really propelled me because I feel like you really need to understand a topic to be able to teach it, but teach it in a way that everyone can understand. You can always regurgitate stuff, but regurgitating something and actually understanding the, the topic or the, the subject matter in its entirety, entirety, only when you reach that can you sort of coach it in a very simple way but still get the, the message across, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I like what you said before about chapter one versus chapter 10. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've always said, for example, when it comes to goal setting, and that could be anything in your life. If you look at the, the end picture, like the, the accomplished goal, it can sometimes... Yep debilitate you and stop you in your tracks because you think wow how the hell do I do everything to achieve that goal whether that be getting the physique you want or writing a book or you know buying a house Mm -hmm. whatever it might be but if you just go right well what is the first step or in your language what is chapter one let's let's work on chapter one and then when you finish chapter one Mm -hmm. chapter two naturally flows along until you finally get to the very end and you go hey it's done that's that's the last chapter that's the end of the goal yeah, so you just have to follow the process, you know, and, and in terms of goal setting or achieving stuff as an adult, we're, we're, we're creating the curriculum. It's not like we're going to uni and there's a curriculum or we're, we're doing a trade and there's a curriculum. If you're starting a business or you're doing something, you're both the teacher and the student. So you need to set these things out and then just follow the damn plan. So for me in the early days, I kind of, I didn't really understand that that much in, in, in regards to sort of like um, put, put, not knowing where I want to go and then breaking it down. So reverse engineering it, mm-hmm. breaking it down to sort of milestones and then just going, okay, all I'm going to focus on is my first milestone. I'm not going to look at milestone two, three, four, five, or six because then you start to get overwhelmed. All you have to focus on is that next milestone. Get there, celebrate, reiterate, and understand if you're still traveling in the right direction. Go to the next milestone. Stop. Celebrate. Understand. You know, take the learnings, whatever. Go again. And then before you know it, you've reached your goal. But if you just keep fi- fixating on that end goal, I feel like it can get overwhelmed. And that's where that sort of crippling, that, that feeling of being crippled and not being able to move forward can, can creep in. And do you think that's also where a lot of the imposter syndrome also comes from? Because people are focusing on the end result when yet they're taking their first One, steps? One hundred percent, one hundred percent, and I'll use myself as an example. Was when I again when I first started doing all this sort of stuff, 
I was going, okay, I want to be this guy. I want to be like that person. I want to be X, Y, and Z. But then I was comparing my chapter negative one because I haven't even started yet to someone's chapter 10, 20. You know, I can get there, but right now it's going to seem like I'm at the bottom of the mountain looking up at the the, the summit or the peak or whatever you, you call you, it. You're, you're, basically, you're basically on the contents page, weren't you? Correct, correct. I love this analogy. Sorry, was, the, the thing, that, the thing I like about this is everyone, everyone that I interview has got this with their own unique sort of language that they use, and they've got their own sort of you know style of putting things across. And, and I love the fact that with you, uh, at the moment we're talking about chapters, for example, and and it's such a wonderful, easy thing to understand. Some people might go, "What the hell's all that about?" But then there could be th- people thinking, "You know what? I get that chapter by chapter." And, I, I love the fact yeah. that everyone's got their own language so that, you know, people who are listening or people who I'm just talking to, everybody can understand it's in the most basic, simple form rather than having something that's so complicated. Yeah, and I, I think that the, 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 the age that we live in is amazing. There's so much information out there. Anything you want to learn, you, you can just, you can learn, but then you kind of get that, what, what's the word, is it? paralysis by analysis where mm-hmm. there's just so much stuff out there that you, you 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 stop yourself before you even begin because you just get overwhelmed but if you just break it down and just go what is my best next step what do I need to learn to get to my end goal focus on that accomplish that and then go okay so I've accomplished that what's my best next step and if you just repeat that week after week after week by the end of three months, you're so much further ahead than where you were when you started. But if you just kept focusing on that end goal, I can almost guarantee you that by the end of the three months, you probably wouldn't have even gotten off the starting blocks. Definitely. And look, we've all we've all heard stories of, of, uh, of that. We've all, we all know people and we've all been through that ourselves. I'm sure there are, yes. I, mean, I can think of times in my life right now as you say that where I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I didn't go after this because of that very reason. Whereas if I'd just taken it step by step or chapter by chapter, I probably would have seen it through. So I think we're all guilty yeah. of that, as you say, uh, paralysis by analysis. It's um, Yeah, it happens to us all. And it almost seems like it's a bit of a, a default that we're hardwired with as humans. Yeah, well, then it's, well, I guess as humans, where we are hardwired to focus on the negative rather than the positive you could have nine positive things and one negative it's human nature to focus on that one negative thing when really why why can't we just go hang on we've achieved nine bloody amazing things but then why is it that our brain automatically goes to that negativity or the, the thing that's perceived to be negative and i think that's a really big learning or teaching yourself to try and not do that and i myself i still suffer from imposter syndrome i still suffer from comparison but i think i just i know my triggers now and i know the state i get into that when i start doing that and i'm able to just go ah tree you're doing again stop it and i'm able to just cut it whereas without having that self-awareness and it's a skill and a muscle that you develop it's really hard to break out of because you kind of let from being a trigger to then having these thoughts that just keep going round and round in your head and to actually believing them and then being sort of crippled. For me personally, I feel like there's a process to getting to that crippled stage. It's just identifying really early when it's coming on and having a process in place to go, no, it's just me, my thinking. Let's look back at all your achievements, what you've done to be able to have evidence to show yourself that, hey, I can do this. And that's just... So with me, when I coach, I always try to improve the client's relationship with themselves first. And what I mean by that is, I guess we've had, however old you are, you've had years of conditioning, meaning, um, you know, subconsciously when something happens, we think a certain way, we do a certain thing because our brain has only had evidence of doing it this way because that's how we've always done it. So what I try to do is just give the brain new evidence. Hey. Um, you know, like some negative self-talk by like, be, oh, Tree, you're really shit with money. You know, you've always been shit with money. You've never been able to do stuff. But that's only because my brain hasn't had evidence or anything to prove otherwise. So now I just need to change that evidence, if that all makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, completely. And I, I like how you say, you know, looking back on something that you have achieved, it may not be the very thing that you're currently going after, but mm. it is important to look back and say, well, 
I've done such and such before and therefore I can do this. And in fact, I, I definitely went through that myself recently where, as you know, I mean, I've, I've been doing comedy for quite some time and I've always done it as a group. And then when I decided mm-hmm. to do my very first solo show, which I did at the beginning of 2024, there was a, mm-hmm. a, a huge feelings of imposter syndrome and self-doubt and disbelief and so forth. But it really was not just myself thinking about looking back, but I said, people even said to me, hey, listen, Jay Newt's, you've been doing comedy shows for seven or eight years. You know, all you have to do is basically, rather than doing 15 minutes, you know, on stage by yourself, you just have to basically do 60. And if you can do 15, yeah. you can do 60. And you've done these shows before. You know the comedy works. You know that your style works and so forth. So if you can do that, if you can do it 15 minutes, surely you can do an hour. And when I really sat back to think about it, I thought to myself, you know what? Well, yeah, I've done six or seven years and the material's always been different yeah. and I've grown as that. And yeah, what is the difference between 15 minutes by yourself on stage compared to an hour? And the thing is, and you'll probably find this with, with everything you've done in your life as well, when I walked out on stage to perform that one hour show, it literally felt like I was on stage for 10 minutes. And even people in the audience were like, yeah, yeah. hey, dude, was that an hour? I'm like, yeah, actually it was. I've got the video to prove it, you know, but it's yeah. like when, when you're just, when you're in that sort of, you know, that, that flow state, that creative state, and you're doing something that you love and people are coming along for the journey. Uh, number one, it feels effortless. Um, time really does fly by and people just, they get engaged. And you, the biggest thing for me was I walked away going, why did I doubt myself? Why did I think, hey, I can't do this when all the evidence was there that I could do it once on a smaller scale? Why couldn't I just increase it a little bit? So that evidence-based thing is such a good thing. But one of the experiences I definitely had is it was hard to recognize that myself to begin with. I had to have you know, people who are friends and family and associates, like through Mantastic, for example, saying, hey, man, you've done yeah. this before. You can do this now. And it's important to have that support network, isn't it? Yeah, and it's just a, it's a massive self awareness piece too. I think is the more self aware you are, the more you're able to go. Oh, even hey, I'm going through this to reach out to somebody or to put processes like you did with, with yourself to kind of not really trick yourself, but just to get yourself to see something objectively. And this is again, I'll digress a little bit, but this is I'm so big on journaling because you're able to just put everything down and look at it objectively rather than letting have whether it be a challenge or even like a good event happen, I find human nature, we add extras to it in our own head. So I like to just journal things and then just go, oh, hang on. It's not really that bad if you look at it objectively and look at the facts rather than sitting there dwelling on it and then adding some more on it. Oh, could this person be doing that? Or maybe they're thinking this, or maybe I did that, or or, or maybe they don't like me or something, when half the times it's just your own head putting extras onto the situation. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So that, that, I just want to, it's, it's a little bit off topic, but I kind of felt like it kind of tied in a little bit the how we as humans, we kind of put so much negative or we, we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. Mm, definitely, definitely. I, I love the fact that you brought up journaling. I mean, look, I've, I've done it. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I haven't got to the stage where I'm doing it religiously day by day. There's mm-hmm. been periods of time where I have. And typically it's mm-hmm. because I've been focused on a particular goal or, or something like that. And I, but what I sort of find is I, I haven't reached that habit yet where I carry on after I've achieved that goal. It's almost like a vision board. Yeah. I, I got into the habit years ago of creating a vision book rather than a vision board. Whenever I achieved yeah. what I wanted, I'd actually just put a tick and write achieved and put the date on it rather than rather than going, oh, I've already got that. I I give myself at least yeah. the congratulations that, hey, you've achieved this. But let's let's mm-hmm. talk about journaling because it is very powerful. Um, I, I, how did you get into journaling, and how have you found that it's actually helped you through your life over the years? So I started journaling once I joined Mantastic and just got taught the power and sort of understood what journaling was. So in my mind, it was before I was sort of like, I thought journaling was like, dear diary, I had a toasted sandwich today, <laughs> then I went for a walk. Then, no, so the babysitter's club, for basically. Me, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. So that's that's yeah. what I originally. And I saw this was, cute girl, then, and oh my god, she hates me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that was what my, in my mind I thought journaling was. <laughs> but um, so how um how I do how I do it is I kind of extract relevant information for me at that particular time. So I kind of have a very basic thing that I 
I journal in the morning and then sometimes I'll journey of journal of an evening. Now, the morning one, I kind of use as, uh, the analogy I use is, you know when you've got a million tabs open on your computer and, you, and it just keeps opening and opening, your computer slows down, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of see that journaling in the morning as my time to be able to close all my tabs down from the day before and start a fresh screen. So I'll just go, okay, so the questions I ask is, what great things happened to me yesterday? So then it it puts me into a a mood or a mindset of gratitude. And then I ask myself, what challenges or um, any bad things that I faced yesterday? And then if they came up again, how would I face that situation or attack that situation differently because now I'm kind of giving myself a blueprint for if it came up again, I went, ah, so this has happened before and this is what I identified how I can approach this situation differently. And another thing is I just go, okay, cool. So what what do I want to, what's been happening to me lately that has been relevant? Sometimes there's nothing, but sometimes there might be maybe relationship challenges, work challenges, or something like that that's been reoccurring that just keeps sitting in my head, I'll just journal about it and just get really factual. So I I try not to put emotion into it. I just go, okay, so this happened, this happened, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, I reacted like this, et cetera, et cetera. So then it's really factual and I can sit there and go, ah, okay, so that's happened. How would I solve this issue? So I, I look at it as a client presenting a challenge to me that needs coaching. So I remove myself away from it and the emotion and look at it as a challenge that needs to be solved. So that's I have a very basic journaling sort of structure and then of an evening, it's just more of a what great things happened to me today. So I, I kind of do that a lot to try and get myself into a positive state rather than always trying to look for negatives. Mm. If that makes sense? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that that's it's really wonderful because – there's no rules to journaling. I think that when people hear things no. like journaling, I think that their mind automatically goes to, oh, I need to have this structured thing. And a journal can be anything. Like there's actually even an app you can download on your phone called Journal, for example, and you can just type it on your phone yes. and it records the date, the time and so forth. And you can look back on it uh, or you can go off there and you can you can buy you know, a journal itself or just a book or you can write a journal on your computer. Or, or so it could even be an online blog if you really wanted to. There's no real yeah, rules when it comes to anything. journaling. Yeah, that's right. But I think yeah. um, I think that the best the best way I think journaling was ever described to me was basically a brain dump. As such, yes, where yes. You, you can you can write you can even just write down thoughts and feelings. I mean, I know in, in myself, I've actually got you know some pages somewhere somewhere in the darkness where I've journaled some of my really hardcore, dark, depressive times because yes, you yes. Know, um, even right. even even though you don't want to relive it and get back into the headspace, it's important to acknowledge this is how I feel and this is why I think I feel how I feel. And every now and again, yes. you can look back on it, going, "Wow, look at how I was," but. I think once you've taken it outside of your brain and it's it's on paper somewhere or it's on a document, it helps to lighten the load a little bit or it can give you more clarity. Yes, 100%. And I'll, I'll share something that I, I personally went through recently. So three, four, five years ago was extremely emotionally unintelligent, um, very ignorant, closed-minded, um, a lot of demons, a lot, a lot of demons. And I've been doing a lot of work, you know, like I've, I would like to think I've, I've improved, uh, you know, maybe tenfold to the person I, I was. But there are times when life is challenging, you're tired, you, like you, you, things that are out of your control happen. I find your demons slowly start to come back, the ones that you feel like you have conquered. And they're the times when I, when I journal, even and I even journal the thoughts that I'm having at that particular time to just to help me understand and go, wow, tree, you've conquered this a long time ago. Why is this coming back for? Mm. And by doing that, it helps me to break out of that, I guess that mindset or that state that I'm in. And that's so, that, that's something that I really encourage everybody to do because. Oh, uh, an analogy that I was told about self-development or bettering yourself is picture a TV that has a broken 
broken wire or a broken connection. Mm -hmm. But once you put that connection in, it starts working again. But with this self-development thing, every morning that that wire is broken. you got to fix it. And that happens every single morning. And when I sort of understood that, it helped me be a little bit kinder to myself. I did digress a little bit here, but it helps me under, to be kinder to myself when these old demons start to slip back because this isn't something that you do and then it's done once. This is a lifetime thing. And that's where I feel like the journaling really comes in is because no, nobody's monitoring us. We don't have a boss that's going, hey, Tree, you, your mind sets off. You're thinking stupid thoughts again. You're doing this, you're doing that. There's nobody doing that. We have to do it for ourselves, and that's why I think journaling is such an amazing tool for that. Yeah, I, I agree. And in fact, the, the thing that I actually love so much about this podcast is talking to every single guest. Uh, there's always been something that they've said or something that I've said where we've connected going, wow, well, I've done that or I've felt that or I was like that when I was a kid. And just hearing what you said then about yourself you know, from four or five yeah. years ago, it, I've definitely gone through that myself where there's been times where I've thought to myself, you know, I'm going backwards. You know, I'm, I'm feel I'm feeling like all that growth I did building my confidence, building my self esteem and, and so forth. I feel that I'm regressing and it's, yes. and it's, it's nice to hear that I'm not alone in those thoughts where other people such as yourself have thought sort of similar things. But I, I love how you have, have just said that journaling has helped in such a good, strong way. I'm also assuming that just because you journal once, it's not going to stop at that particular day. It needs to be that I need to keep going. And it, over the space of a few days or a week or whatever it might be, you may find that your mindset has then shifted. Yes. So it's, it's almost like that kickstart. I see it as you're aware and you, you bring it to the front of your mind, whether you solve it that day, that week. It, it, it's irrelevant because it's there now and you know it needs to be solved rather than just letting it, letting your subconscious do its thing in the background, putting you into a negative state or whatnot and being totally unaware of it. So that, that that's a that's a really big thing is just bringing that self-awareness in front of mind, I feel, um, the, the, the benefit from journaling. I think with, with anything that comes to improving our lives, these things take time and not just time to actually see the change, feel the change and so forth, but also being disciplined to go, okay, I'm going to start a journal and I'm going to devote 10 minutes of my day every day to write in it. If you use the excuse yeah. of, well, I haven't got a spare 10 minutes, you basically need to say, well, I need to create a spare 10 minutes. For example, I mean, to do this podcast, as you know, this morning, um, you know, I woke up very early to match our time zones. Now, I could have yeah. said to myself, oh, look, you know, I'll I'll wake up at seven o'clock and I'll just, you know, whatever. But I went, no, Tree's a busy man. He's got his schedule. You know, uh, I'll wake up at a certain time to get this done so that it's it's done, it's in the can, you know, and I'm, I'm not wasting his time yeah. and, and, and so forth. It's about, yeah. it's about finding the time or, or making sure that you give yourself the time to find the time rather than going, oh, I can't squeeze it into my day. And I think a lot of people either don't develop a habit or they drop a habit because they just go, oh, well, in my busy day, I can't do this. I, I think it's, it goes back to the society of instant gratification. You know, it's the old analogy of you don't plant the seed to sit in the shade of the, the tree tomorrow. You, it, it's something that you do for the long term. And I see journaling as one of those things is you don't journal today and just see immediate something happen the next minute. It's something that it's almost like those roots, you know, you plant that seed, roots are growing all of these, but nothing pops through. But then all of a sudden when it pops through, you think, oh, something's come through, but there's a whole heap of work, roots, all sorts of things that have worked underneath before you actually see that, that plant shoot through the ground. That's how I see journaling. Do, do you feel that instant gratification is, is actually a subconscious thing that people don't really think about, but that's probably one of the biggest causes of things like depression, anxiety, imposter syndrome, yes. and so forth? 100%. I, I, like, I personally believe that, and I personally believe that it's social media and the way we receive information now. You know, Everything has to be super fast. They want it right now. You know, if, if all these get-rich-quick schemes, I, I want to put in work a week and I want to be a millionaire next year. And I, 
it's I think it's just this information age that we live in, but I really believe that it's the social media and things like that are just that's really fueling this instant gratification society or culture or whatever you want to call it. I, th- I think the other thing behind instant gratification and the way the society has moved and perceived is these days we're so used to seeing a result and and you see an amazing performance or a, you know someone with an incredible physique or a very successful business or whatever the case may be and you think, wow, mm-hmm. I want that and I want that now but no one ever yes. stops and thinks about but that was a 10-year journey to make a successful business or that was three yeah. hardcore years in the gym to get that physique or whatever it was. People mm-hmm. people never look at the journey. They always just look at the end result and go, oh, I want that. And as you said, social media and all these you know, influencers, um, which has become a buzzword and so forth, it's all about showing, look how good I am. But number one, it's, yes. it, it, it's more often than not very false. And number two, if it's not false, no one ever realizes that there was a huge journey of struggle to get to that success. Yes, yes, 100%. And that's why with all of my stuff, like, I mean, as much as I dislike social media or whatever, it's part of our world now. And from a business perspective, I feel like you really need to use it as a tool. And even, you know, we're, 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 this kind of circles back to the imposter syndrome is people want it now. You know, they look at, say, you know, someone really successful and they go, oh, you know, why am I there yet? I've been doing this for two weeks. Well, this person has been doing it for 20 years. You know what I mean? But then we, it, things are so curated and whatnot, the things that we consume, they only show the pretty side. You know, they only show them on the yacht or flying over to Maldives or whatever it is. And everybody thinks, oh, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur because this is what it gives me. What else does it give you? You know what I mean? Like sleepless nights, wondering if you're going to make rent or, you know, there's a whole heap of stuff that, uh, that has led to this particular destination that nobody sees and then everybody just gets attracted to the flashy lights and the shiny objects and doesn't realize that, man, it's taken this person 20 years of grind to get here. So I, that, that's, uh, I 100% agree with you is sort of people always want that, that success or that big goal right now and they don't want to go through the journey. And I know it's quite cliche, but I'm a firm believer is just, making the journey the goal you know the journey is the goal because if you if you execute the journey with resilience and i guess with hard work and just that i'm going to make it no matter what the goal is inevitable that the the outcome is inevitable whether it be the outcome that you want or not that an outcome will be inevitable because if you're putting in all this work and just pushing pushing something's got to come out of it but people are just so so impatient or i don't even know what the word is they just want it now and they don't focus on the journey they just focus on the destination which i feel is asked about because the journey is what makes you the journey is makes you appreciate the destination so much more and i know you know in fantastic tommy will say yeah tommy he kind of used the analogy of if you were just put on top of mount everest does that really make you a, a climber or achieve a big goal? No. It just means that you pay someone to drop you on top of Mount Everest. Whereas <laughs> if you climbed Mount Everest, it's made something of you. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that, they're my thoughts on that. Well, look, these days everyone, I think the word success has become such a buzzword because people, yes, yes. And, 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 and success and instant gratification sort of seem to go hand in hand because people look at, they want to be successful but they don't want the journey. And I remember once, um, I remember seeing an interview uh, on YouTube, actually. It was Peter Sellers. I think he was being interviewed by Michael Parkinson. And they were talking about one of the films he made. It may have even been Pink Panther. And he was talking about that there were so many actors who would you know, race through making the movie because they just wanted to see the end, the end result. But Peter Sellers, yeah. he said, you know, I, he said, as an actor, you have fun between the words action and cut. That's when you're having fun. Yeah. He said, because when you finish yes. shooting the last scene of the movie, the movie's done. When you watch the movie, you're watching what you have, like you're watching the fun that you've had. You have now, you've gone through that. And 
and I know this myself from making my own movie or doing my own comedy shows, for example, you can look back and go, wow, I'm so proud of the movie or the show or whatever. But the journey of making it, writing it, producing it, acting in it, all that type of stuff, that is the success part. Because if you go, I've finished it and I'm happy with the accomplishment, success isn't about being a millionaire or being world recognized. Success is about, hey, I achieved this goal. And look at the fun I had on the journey to achieving this goal. And that is a stepping stone of success. Well, you look, look, look at today. We'll use this podcast, for example, and you, the, um, when you spoke before and you said it's 4.30 in the morning there and it was quite easy for you to just go, oh, you know what, I'm just going to stay in bed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you're, you're loving this journey. You know, you're become, you, you're building a relationship with yourself. You're going, you know what, I really want this end goal and whatever your end goal of this podcast may be, you really want that. But it's these little steps that make something of you because now Jay Newton is somebody who gets up at 4.30 because he has an end goal and no matter what it takes, he gets up, he's made a promise a commitment to myself and to yourself that you're going to get up at this time because we both have busy schedules and this is the only time that happens, um, that we can make it happen. So that's what I mean. It's this journey. It's, it's these, you know, it's the hard times. It's the uncomfortable, you know, all the uncomfortable stuff, all the things that you don't want to do, but the fact that you've done it, it's making something of you. You know, you're building a better relationship with yourself. You're becoming a person who's reliable, who sticks to his word. And I see that as the true accomplishment in, in my eyes. Well, it, it is. And I think that society, and this is probably where depression, anxiety, imposter syndrome, all those sort of negative emotions and thoughts and beliefs, it, it really does stem from, I, I guess, a false sense of what success is. And that, uh, and that is yes. things like, oh, success is being a millionaire. Success is having you know, a hot wife yes. or, or an expensive car or a private jet or being able to go off to the Mel Dives every, every 12 months or thereabouts. I think yes, you pe- hit the nail on the head with that one. And this is, this is, where, social, this is where social media, this I always call it, you know, anti-social media because as you so rightly said a little while ago, social media is a great tool if you use it correctly. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. yes. unfortunately I, I, social media has become a way that people just interact with, on a, on a mind-numbing, no-brain basis. And I'm like, we've, we all see this. I guarantee if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're driving down the street or you could be at home after your day or you could be about to leave the house for your day, I guarantee that sometime through the day you have driven past a plethora of people just standing around either by themselves or in a, or in a group with their head down in their phone. All yep. the time, and he, or you'll see people walking down the street with earbuds in their ear at all times. They're not even talking; they're just walking. And you think, "Wow, you, we are so connected to this device." And yes. look at all the time we're wasting. Like if you just, you know, put the phone down and put your head up and look at the world around you and focus on things, you you see a bigger picture. Yeah, we- and, and social media, everyone wants to get involved with the, the latest meme or the latest, you know, viral TikTok video, or whatever. But all it does is it keeps you in that horrible circle of oh well look at what somebody else has got and it feeds the imposter syndrome it feeds it feeds the, de- the depression it can feed all the negativity but unfortunately it's disguised as a rush of endorphins that make us happy at that second yeah well you got to think it is a big business and there are very intelligent super intelligent psychologists and all sorts of people that have designed these things to keep you engaged because your attention is what they're selling. So that's the biggest thing when I realized that because I, uh, this might be an ego thing or whatnot, but I hate feeling like I'm getting taken advantage of and that's exactly what's happening. You know, they've designed this thing to keep you glued to it so then they can sell your attention. So you you are actually the product. You become the product that they're selling. So yeah, it's scary. It's so, so scary what, just to think of if this continues like this, we're just going to be like those rats that are just in those cages running experiments and stuff. And we're so oblivious to it that we, we don't even have it in our mindset to go, hey, I've got to stop this because we don't even know what's happening. Well, you see, I, I have a theory and, and I'm, this is like a Pandora's box and it's either going to be one of those, oh, wow, light bulb moments or it's going to be one of those, oh, fuck moments. I saw a, I saw a picture once, and it was all these people on their phones at a I think it was at a bus stop, like literally about twenty mm-hmm. people on their phone, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, look at the world we've created!" Where everyone's in, you know, not interacting with each other, and they've, you know, it's all that social media, and they're not interacting with humans around them. 
But then the same post put up a photograph of people from literally about 60 or 80 years prior to that waiting yep. somewhere and every single person was newspapers. buried in newspapers. So newspapers yep. were the social media of, of the time. So news in general, whether it be you know what I had for breakfast this morning or whatever is printed in a newspaper, has been used for decades and decades and decades to, as you say, keep people in a locked mindset. And the, the weird paradox... This is becoming a deep conversation, man. The weird paradox is if, if anyone's ever watched that movie, The Secret, they openly yep. talk about there about, you know, the secret was kept in the few. They didn't want people to realize that they could achieve all these things. So it was kept in the mindset of the rich and famous and the successful. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that mentality still exists and it's called social media. Whereas in the past, it was yes. called this is the nine to five or this is the newspapers. They've always found a way of locking society's minds in to control Mm -hmm. a certain aspect of them rather than saying you can yeah. do whatever you want it's all about making people feel like shit it's not about making people feel good <laughs> no well i'd say I, I don't know if you've heard of a book called stolen focus by johan harry harry i think it is stolen focus I'll um, have to, I'll no, have but anyway that one. yeah so it's about how as humans our our attention span has diminished over the decades and one of the theories or research pieces that they've done on it is every time there's a new way of consuming information so um, whether it be books to newsletters to TVs now social media it has a very profound effect on humans ability to focus and I guess um, uh, our, our attention span so you can imagine with a newspaper even though all those things are 100% agree with but to sit down and to read a newspaper, you kind of have to have some sort of focus and you have to go deep on that particular article or whatever. But you look at how we consume our information now. Everything is in bite-sized pieces of 30-second reels, 30-second little someone sits talking or something. So our brain isn't it, – it hasn't – our brain hasn't evolved over how, however many years. Like the, Let's call it a million years or whatever it is but the technology and whatever has. So our brain doesn't know what's going on. All it's seeing is all these bite-sized pieces that are coming at us. You know what I mean? Like before social media, you, you, the, the, the information you consume was either magazine or book. You had to really go deep. Whereas now we're getting thousands of bite-sized pieces of information coming at us Second, in yeah. a day. Oh, yeah. So then our brain... Yeah, so now our brain, the attention span is 30 seconds. It's got to look for something new. 30 seconds, something new. So then that's that dopamine too. We're constantly chasing those little dopamine hits. And these people, Mark Zuckerberg, he knows this. You know what I mean? So that's why he's developed the like button. He's developed, you know, all these things that make you go, oh, how many likes have I got? Oh, how many people's engaged in my, oh, all this sort of stuff. Because our brains, it's sort of like that rat that knows that if it eats this thing, it's going to get zapped. But because it's giving it dopamine, it's going to keep eating it, keep eating it, keep eating it. So we're becoming these sort of brain-dead rats that are in this massive experiment that somebody else is capitalizing on. So I, I thought I'd just share that little piece of information from the book because it's when you brought that up, it's so true. We've, we're always being manipulated, but the way we are being manipulated really affects our focus and our attention. Oh, absolutely. But the thing is, I mean, we've spoken before about, you know, human brains being hardwired to a certain way. And I, I honestly yeah. also think that humans, by default, crave validation and adulation. Now, for, yes. For example... One million percent. Yes. <laughs> for example, I mean, when... One um, million percent. When, when I've done the comedy shows in the past, you, you see so many comedians who have a review from, you know, a, a newspaper or a magazine or a radio station or whatever... And a lot of comedians will chase a reviewer. Oh, did I get a review? Is there a reviewer in tonight? Did I get a review last night? And yep. it's, it's interesting because I find that so many people are focused on getting a review. And half the time, if they do, it might not even be a good review. But they crave, oh, did I get a reviewer? Because they believe that a one person's opinion in print suddenly will help to you know bring in more tickets. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. The, the, the right review at the right time can definitely change things. I've heard stories that do. But, I mean, 
I've, I've, I think in all the time I've done comedy, we've only had maybe one or two reviewers and that was it. And, the, and unfortunately, they were also remote reviewers during the lockdown period where we had to show them a video rather than come to a live show. Oh, but right. Yeah. I, I have found that the best reviews I've ever had, whether it be for comedy or anything in my life, has always been people coming up and talking to me or they'll write something yeah. they'll write yeah. something to me on on you know via email or whatever it might be and go well, hey listen I love that show I love the way that we connected or whatever the, the case may be and it's so much it's some, for me I find that getting feedback from something that's genuine than something that was contrived because look a reviewer's a review yeah they're sort of being genuine to themselves, but they were also employed to go off and watch your show or they're employed mm. to review your book or whatever the case may be. So they've got their business hat on rather than their their, their own personal hat on. And I mean, these mm. days, I've even said to my publicist, I don't care if I, if I get reviews. I mean, if I get an amazing audience review on Google or the email, I'll use that because it's a genuine review. But we do mm. tend to crave adulation all the time and i think that that's once again if we don't get it it leads to depression imposter syndrome and all that sort of you know rabbit hole of negativity yeah and i'd say so i'll use myself as an example and i recently went through this and it kind of really not really shocked me but it really brought it to the front of my attention is so when i'm coaching sometimes i coach well one to many or i'm talking one to many and I'll use a Zoom call, right? If I'm talking to like a, a big group of people, I found myself naturally scanning for nods, you know, someone nodding or some sort of approval, and and then when I saw it, it made me feel like, oh, cool, what what, what I'm saying is 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 good or is is true or it's it's landing or whatnot. So I'm I was constantly searching for that validation in the background without even realizing it. And I'm so glad you brought that up because this happened the other night and I thought, Tree, you, you got to stop doing this because regardless if someone approves or validates you or whatnot, it doesn't change the fact that you still need to deliver this information to the best of your ability. So even if there was one person not nodding or a thousand people nodding, it shouldn't change how I deliver the, the information that I'm about to deliver. So thanks for bringing that up because I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> uh, no, my pleasure, my pleasure. And do you yeah. bring do you bring all of this into your uh, into your PT coaching as well? Yes. So I always so everything that these things every time I come to these realizations or whatever you want to call them, I try to see all areas of my life where it could be getting affected. And in terms of PT, the same thing would be when I'm talking and I explaining something or I'm explaining a, a lift or a concept or something about nutrition, I was searching for that validation. I was searching for those nods or that sort of that look of awe or whatnot. But then it, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter if I get it or not because that information is still the information I want to deliver. So if I'm, if I'm delivering that information and somebody looks disapproved, it doesn't change that what I'm delivering is factual. If, if that makes sense, so it, it shouldn't change it does, how yeah. I do things, but I was letting it. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I've had experiences myself, and it's 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 slightly different, but the, the message is exactly the same. Where I've seen comedians uh, on stage, and there'll be one person in the audience who's not laughing, but what they'll do is they'll focus yep. all their attention on that one person who's not yeah. laughing to try to get them to laugh. And unfortunately, what that does. Mm is it can take you off out of your out of your mindset it can disrupt your flow and the rest of the audience become aware of well you, you're not you're not here for us anymore you're here for that person you're ignoring the rest of us and you actually you don't just lose your own focus but you lose the focus of the audience and it's the same i think it's the same thing as what you're basically saying where you know uh -huh. if if you focus on the, that one thing that's not doing so well you know, it takes away from the fact that, hey, I'm still delivering this and I don't need everybody's validation. It's that 80-20 rule, isn't it? You're never going to get 100% of an audience agree no. with you or yep. enjoying what you have to do. You just have to go, I'm doing this, I'm having fun, and I'm engaging with the people who are enjoying it, and I'm not seeking out the people who are like, oh, well, you need to keep proving yourself to me. Yep, mate, I'm so glad you brought that up because I found myself doing that where if there was a whole group of people and there was one that it was a look that I perceived to be um, not receptive or 
not happy with what I'm doing or whatnot. And, and again, it was just my perception. It made it's not even reality. I found myself tailoring my presentation or tailoring whatever that I'm doing to try and get that person on board when I could be alienating the other 19, 20 people that are resonating with the message that I'm I'm presenting, but I'm so fixated or focused on that one person that may be negative that I could be screwing up my whole presentation when I could have just, like you're saying, focus on the 80% and forget about the 20 because that's just life, isn't it? There's always going to be somebody that doesn't like you or doesn't resonate with what you're saying. So it's pointless to try and get everybody on board. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I also know that you know at our own time in our lives, we have been that negative person, whether it be listening to yeah. somebody give a speech about bodybuilding or <laughs> the classic is religion, where Mate, people I, try to force religion on somebody. There's always somebody who is like, just fuck off, I don't care, and there's nothing that you can do or say that's going to make me change my mind. And I, I was that person. I was that person for so long, and I think it was just because I had a big chip on my shoulder, and maybe I just hated the world no oh, well that's ext- that's a bit extreme but you know like i just had this big massive chip on my shoulder but it's a reflection of me not the person delivering the the, the the information or the presentation it's me so then to see it from that perspective it's it's a bigger reflection on that person than it is on you it, it that helps me sort of change my mindset towards that thing or or towards trying to get validation all the time because you're you're not going to be able to get it from everybody. Never, never. Now look, you you sound like anyone who's listening to this is probably thinking to themselves, "Wow, you're so switched on. You've got all these wonderful habits, and a lot of people can only aspire to this." But it, let's be honest with you. You know, you're 42 years old now. You haven't had this mindset yep. your entire life. So no. So how, how did you how did you so, start, how did you start off, and, and what was your journey to get to this particular stage? Because you've got some great systems in place now. You've got a wonderful mindset. You're going to keep building forward on that. But what was Tree like prior to all of this? All right. So Tree Tree prior to this was so oh, I was somebody who was extremely closed minded, and it was sort of like. If anybody disagreed with my views or my philosophies or ideas or whatnot, they were wrong. They're a dickhead. They're against me. They're stupid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That was my mindset in that regard. But from emotional intelligence was lacking, um, so anger was always the first thing I would go to. You know, like anything that happened, it was spit the dummy, get angry. N- never really listened. Um, never really believed in myself. I, I kind of talked a big game saying, oh, I can do this, I can do that, but I, I, I just don't want to. But in hindsight now, I kind of feel that was all a massive excuse because I was actually really afraid of what it really was going to take for me to change my life. And I'll, I'll draw back to when I first joined Mantastic. Where I was in that point in life was I knew I could not, keep going with the way I was going and be, I guess it, in, in my heart, I always knew there was more to life than what I had achieved, but I just didn't know how to do it. So when Mentastic came along, I just went, okay, look, this is, this is something that I really have to lean into if I want to progress. And it was really hard like to be able to, to break all those old habits. But then once, like when we went to the beginning of this um, this podcast where I was saying it was all about building a better relationship with yourself, I started keeping promises to myself. You know, like I hate, you know, to be honest, when I first started this, I hated journaling. I hated waking up early in the morning. I was like, this is such a waste of time. Why am I sitting down writing about all this sort of stuff? But I just went, you know what? I can't say this doesn't work if I don't give it my all. If I don't go through it to the 100% to the end, and if it doesn't work, then I have the right to say, hey, this didn't work for me. But if I've only done it a couple of times and I went, oh, well, it's not working, I, I don't have the right to do that. So that's where I started was just going, okay, I'm going to do this. And then as things started to build, I started to build that better relationship with myself. And I went, you know what? I, I Not from an egotistical or big noting perspective, but I just went, you know what? I deserve better. You know, I deserve to be somebody who 
doesn't fly off the handles every time something doesn't go his way. I deserve to be somebody who is patient, who has good communication skills. So then I just went, okay, so I'm going to start leaning into it. Start learning, start learning. And then it was back to that when we were talking at the beginning, the first milestone, I just started going, okay, so I'm not going to worry about the end goal. What's my first milestone? My first milestone is just to, and I remember this, is to stop getting angry and so reactive. And that, Jane Yutes, that was the most difficult thing that I, I've had to do because for I was 38 at this stage and for 38 years of my life that's how I acted I reacted to things you know there was never sitting down sitting with my emotions feeling it just let it do its thing learn from it but don't react to it so um, I know that's a very sort of like in a nutshell sort of answer that's wonderful but it was just yeah thank you and it was just I, I, yeah. I love I love the fact that you can just be open and tell me that you were so reactive for such a long time. I mean, mm. there's a huge difference between being reactive and proactive. I mean, I remember yes, there was a, a I used to love watching uh, Disney cartoons as a kid. I used to love Donald Duck, and there was one particular time where he was in a rage. His face was drawn really red, where steam was coming out of his ears and so forth. And whoever the character was, I said, like, just you know. I'll just count to 10 and he'd count down from 10. Then he got to about six or, or five or thereabouts and the redness came out of his face and he was like, oh, hey, that calmed me down. And I've always yeah. taken that in some ways, not, okay, maybe not all the time, but I've taken that into my adult life because there are some times where you think a situation will happen and you can either react to it straight away, typically very emotionally, or you can take 10 mm-hmm. seconds or 10 minutes or 10 days if you want to and be proactive about it and go, well, what is the best response to that? And how do I tackle this? Because if you react to it half the time, you're not only coming across as a fool or somebody who's emotionally, Mm -hmm. you know, not together, but you're actually just keeping yourself in a bad headspace and you just, you just another reason to tell yourself why things aren't working for you and why things are so bad and keeping yourself in a horrible negative way. Mm. So it's almost like information bias our brain is looking for evidence to support that whatever narrative we're telling ourselves. You know, so obviously there's always going to be good and bad, but if you, if, well, I'll use myself as an example. If you keep telling yourself, you know, like, oh, you know, you're really shit at such and such, you never do this, you know, you, you've always failed, then your brain naturally looks for evidence to support that narrative that you have. You know, oh, yeah, you know, that time um, – you, 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 you wasted all your money on such and such. Yeah, you're pretty as shit at money. Or that other time you, you did such and such with your money. You're really bad with money. So that's why I'm so big on gratitude is it kind of, it, it, it's, it breaks that circuit from always looking for the negative to go, you know what? I'm fucking happy that I'm alive. It's a good day. The sun's shining. My parents are alive. Um, I've got water to drink. I've got a food over my a roof over my head. It's a good fucking day. So just looking at it from that perspective, they're going, oh my God, fucking hell, I've got bills coming up, I've got this, I've got that. Both things are true. They're both true, but then why put yourself into a negative situation if there's nothing you can do about that situation? You know, like a thing that I always ask myself when I face a challenge is what's in my control and what's not in my control. So anything that's in my control, I go and action it. And then I'm done because all the other stuff is not in my control. So no amount of stressing, no amount of negativity, no amount of anything is going to change that. And and then that took a lot of, I guess, training myself to to be that way because for years I was always always negative. Oh, my God, you know, this has happened. The world's going to end, tree, you're so stupid, this is that, that, blah, 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 blah. But why? When there's as many negatives, there's an equal amount of positives. Oh, look, definitely. And, and you've mentioned gratitude several times so far through this podcast. Mm. And let's let's talk yeah. more about it because I think when people start to hear about expressing gratitude and try to do it every single day, I, I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, my God, wow, look, such like what do I have to be thankful for? And there seems to be so much. And mm. I, think that, I think that people can default to thinking that it's something other than it's not. I mean, I know with me, for example, 
I, I, I was outside just before our call, and like I said, I can hear yeah. the birds, the sun's up, there's nobody around, there's a nice crispness to the air, and even though I didn't yeah. stop to think, wow, I'm so grateful for being alive, there was that m- yeah. a few seconds of appreciation going, wow, what a beautiful moment. That is me expressing gratitude, and I think there's so many yeah. people that think, oh, I need to sit down. I need to, you know, grab a hold of my, you know, of my my journal, and I need to express myself. I think mm-hmm. grat- gratitude is basically just, as they say, stopping to smell the roses, as such, and just enjoying yeah. the moment and experiencing it for what it is. I don't think you necessarily need to say thank you, but you can do it in your own way. But how have you found that gratitude has not only worked for you, but how did you develop the habit of being grateful? <sighs> I think the thing that really this is why I like travel is when I when I traveled that's when because prior to um, this whole I guess phase of um, me becoming more self-aware self-development all that sort of stuff I'd never traveled like I the, the only place I've been prior to this whole this phase is to America and that's to compete in a bodybuilding show and I really love travel because it puts things into perspective and you become really grateful for what you have because you can see what it looks like to not have the things you do. So to answer your question, it was after I started traveling and I went, you know what? My problems aren't really that bad. You know, I've, I've got a roof over my head. Some people don't even have that. You know, I've got running water. Some people don't even have that. You know, I've got clothes. I've got you know, I, 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 you know, I, I've got healthcare. I've got all these sorts of things that I've taken for granted before. But I'm very, very, very lucky. So to answer your question, it's when I sort of first fantastic, but then really when I started to travel and just see things from a different perspective, it just really helped me just be grateful for what I got. And I'll, I'll, I'll share a, a quite a personal story, and I'll try not to get emotional about talking about this. Mm-hmm. But um, so. My mother got diagnosed with cancer last year, uh-huh. and it wasn't when I went through that. I just went fuck, you know, all the stuff that I'd been sort of upset about or things that have gotten to me. I would, I would go through all those things again, or I guess not go go through those things, and oh, I'd go for whatever bad shit that I kind of perceive if it meant mum survived. So then I just went, fuck. So all these things that go on in our head, we kind of amplify to make them out to be worse than they are, but nothing can be worse than losing your parents, yeah? Well, they, they probably are, but that, that's up there. Yeah. So then that just put things into yeah. perspective for me to go, are you just making shit out of nothing? Meaning, are you, ex- are you building these little little things that might be a little challenge into like massive things that are going to crush you. I kind of think so because when it comes to a negative or something that really affects you, losing a parent pretty much tops it in my books, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that most humans have a moment of realization of, hey, I need to do something about my goals, my dreams, or my attitude, or whatever. It's a shame how that clarity comes through so much uh, grief and pain. It can come through yes. trauma such as losing a parent or losing a, a, a pet or whatever the case may be. I mean, look, yeah. uh, you, you and me have got things in common there. I mean, look, my uncle passed away of cancer, and watching him go through that journey, I, I realized there's a lot of things in his life that – he never he never achieved you know not just because of other health complications but also because he he passed away when he did and and that was one of the biggest catalysts for me to move to the UK mm-hmm. because I, I'd always put it off going I'll do it one day do it one day and then when watching him go through that and realizing what he hadn't achieved I said to myself yes. you know what no I need to do this I I just have to do it because yeah. I didn't want to be on my deathbed thinking if only I'd done this, if only I did this, you know, and yes. and it's unfortunate because you do think to yourself, well, why did it take such an atrocity and such an emotional grieving time to give me absolute clarity to follow what I want? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's so weird, isn't it? Like you can sort of, it takes something so massive for you to just change your mindset when 
you, you could have done it yourself. Well, I, I speak for myself, or I speak for myself is I could have done this years and years and years ago. But then, why did it take something so traumatic and so you know that could have been extremely painful for me to go fuck? You know, what, that's stupid to think like that. Why was I thinking like that? So, but I guess that's just human nature. We need a really compelling reason or something that really, really hurts us for us to to, to move off, to, to move from the trajectory that we're, we're going on, you know? Yeah, and this is the danger of being consumed by things like social media and negativity yes. and so forth because it takes your mind and all your attention away, not just from your dreams and your goals, but from the things you should be grateful for in your life, such as family, parents, running water, all these things. And, you know, it's the same thing. Like if, if you get told you've got a health scare, you suddenly become grateful for the fact that you used to have health. <laughs> but people yeah. don't walk around every day thinking, oh, it's so good to be able to walk or it's so good to be able to breathe. You know, it, yeah. it, it is taken for granted, that whole thing of, well, yeah, well, I've, I've, just br- I've just taken a breath out. You will naturally take a breath in. But there will always come a point yeah. in every person's life where that next intake of breath will not happen ever again. And that's the unfortunate reality that's, of life. Do you know what I mean? That's the one thing that I think, that's the one thing that we are guaranteed in life, that we will one day be dead. Nothing else is guaranteed but that. Yeah, that's that's what I one say. thing. Death and taxes. <laughs> That's, that's, that's exactly right. That's been <laughs> and if we can laugh at both, we're winning. I'll tell you what, we've, that's it, you know? we've, we've mentioned Mantastic several times, uh, and by the sounds of what you've already touched upon, it's had a profound effect on your life in only four years, as you said, from, from Tree when he was 38 to Tree now when he's 42. And we've discovered there's already been such a massive change in the way that you look at the world, the way that you react to things, the way that you tackle your goals and, and everything. Let's talk about, first of all, how did you get into the Mantastic program and what what sort of, what has been the outcome so far to your life through that program? Well, um, all right. So what, why, ah, so the, the reason for joining Mantastic was, like I said to you before, I was just at a point in my life where I've been, so my whole life I've just been in failed relationship after failed relationship, but I never took accountability for any of those, I guess, failures. It was always, ah, oh, it was because she was this or that happened or she was a bitch or, you know, the usual sort of story. I never really took accountability for it. That was one. I was, I was in a, in a job that was very, like, it was very well paid, but it's extremely toxic and, I just wasn't happy. You know, every day I went there, it was Groundhog Day. I was in golden handcuffs and I just felt like there, there was so, so much more and I just didn't know how to get it. And that's when maybe Mark Zuckerberg was listening to me and he sent me a, a, um, <laughs> a, 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 a um, an advert for uh, Mantastic. And I just thought, you know what? What have I got to lose? I'm, I'm just going to give this thing a go. So I went to the live event listen to Tommy and I really resonated with what he was saying and I thought, you know what? I'm going to give this my all. I'm going to give this 100% and if it doesn't work, at least say, you know what? This whole self-development thing is a crock of shit. It's not for me. It doesn't work. So I just really linked in and I just started actioning everything that I need to action and the first goal that we set was to resign from my job and to build a business and I did that in, in exactly a year. And that was my first thing that proved to me that went, fuck tree, you know what? You can do this. Because to, to, to be able to build the business, now this isn't a flex or anything like that, so please don't think it's, it's that. It's, you know, to from going from somebody like that to being able to build a business to the point where I could leave my employment and not really feel that much hurt was a fucking huge achievement for me. And I went, you know what, I, I think I can do this. So then I just started looking at other areas. You know, I built a business. I went, uh, I resigned from my job and then I went, okay, you know, the tree before was attracting the women that he was attracting for a reason because he was that person. So then I started to understand that I had to be my 10 out of 10 partner to attract my 10 out of 10 partner. So... I just started learning how to communicate a lot better, learning to how to control my emotions more, learning to compromise. It wasn't always trees way or no way. Um, 
just learning all those sorts of things. And then, and I wasn't even in a place to even look for a partner. And then Jade, my fiance now, she, so she was a client and I'm not that trainer. I just said a, a little, um, whatever the word is, I'm, I'm not that kind of trainer, <laughs> but it's just the way it happened. But, um, so, but Jade, she was the t- she isn't the type of woman that I a could have attracted before, or even was attracted to. But and then now in hindsight, it's because of my mindset. I was still extremely immature. Do you know what I mean? Like, and and I'm just going to be totally open and honest here. And the type of what I would look for in a woman before was, oh, she hot. She got a nice ass. You know, she got nice tits. You know, mm. nice hair. All this sort of stuff. But that's so superficial. You know, it's so surface level because all of that stuff runs out. You know, one day youth leaves, and I I never really I was didn't have the maturity or even the the insight to understand that until I started to work on myself and understand. Ah, uh, so to be a better partner, I need to communicate better. It's not just oh, I've got tattoos and the big muscles and shit like that. I'm going to attract my dream partner. That's that was my mindset. It, the mindset I had to switch to was there's more to this. You need to become a total person. Um, so that was that. And then I, I attracted Jade, and you know, business. There was a period in time when business was really, really. I was quite dire. I was even thinking of like, shit, is this even something that I, I even want to do? But the fact that I'd made this promise to myself that I was going to just go no matter what. I've made it through that period. And all of these things and what I was saying to you before about the goal setting and loving the journey, I feel like if I'm if I had just been put where I am now in life without going through all that, I would still be a fuckhead, one hundred percent. Like I, I, and that's not even a, a shadow of a doubt. And the the person that I am now is I've pretty much if so in four years I've been able to you know, I've changed my career. I've, I've pretty much changed my whole mindset and I guess the were me. I've, I've changed me. You know, I've changed my environment. I've, you know, I've, I've built this um, from business. I've built this amazing community of people who genuinely care and want to see each other um, achieve cool things. So, so to answer your question, where was I then and where am I now? That's the difference. And I seriously, seriously don't think I could have got here without going through all the hard shit. Does that answer your question? I know I rambled oh, on a little bit. No, it, 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 just, it just sounds that, that Mantastic has had such a profound effect on your life in such a short period of time. And, and you can just, just listening to you talk, not just in that last five minutes, but also just through the whole podcast, you can really hear the the um, the emotional journey within this last hour just you know from you know your expressions and 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 the joy in your voice and so forth you know i can tell mantastic has had such a hugely profound effect on your life like your life in four years has drastically changed from the first 38 and the the you know the the next half of your life is going to be even more drastically amazing because of all these things that you've already learned and you will continue to learn Thank you. And, you know, that's why I'm so passionate. That's why I, I, I'm a coach in Fantastic now is because I'm so genuinely passionate about helping other men improve themselves, not from – because I, I, I really think this the, – as a modern man, these are the skills that you need. You know, like the gone are the days of like the 70s where a man is just like this brute beer-drinking guy who – bashes people on the head and drags women into his caves and has his way with them. I feel like this is what a modern man is, somebody who is, you know, emotionally intelligent, goal-driven, uh, you know, about family and just genuinely wanting to help other people rather than just being like all about him and proving how big his penis is and smashing people and stuff like that. I, I genuinely think we got it wrong there and as a man, it's, it's not about being that brute. It's just about knowing who you are, knowing, you know, what you want to put out into the world and just family, man. That, that's that's what I truly believe as being a, a, like a man in this modern world it, it, it is. I'm probably wrong, but that's probably, that's just my, I guess, view on it. 
Look, I don't, I don't think you're wrong at all. And this is this takes us all the way back to all the you know the bad things about social media. Is unfortunately, look, I agree completely with everything you just said. But if you watch social media, you'll see a whole bunch of women, for example, talking about, oh, well, no, we don't want simps, and we don't want you know men to 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 be that particular way. We want men to be men, and so forth. But then on the flip side, also on social media, you've still got women talking about toxic masculinity and don't talk to me and how dare you look at me and so forth. But and, you know, I think the essence of being a man definitely is it's not being a fuckwit. It's still about going after your goals and, and your dreams and so forth, but having the values in your life about being grateful for your life and the people in your life and not being superficial and so forth. All right. There's all these all these different things. So I think you've actually hit it on the head perfectly, to be honest. Yeah, thank you. So just in wrapping things up, Tree, uh, for any man who's out there listening to this, uh, if they've heard of Mantastic, I mean, hopefully they've listened to the uh, the podcast with Tommy from episode 13. And if you haven't, please go and listen to it because Tommy is incredible and he not only talks about Mantastic, but his incredible journey leading up to the creation of Mantastic. But to anyone yep. who is out there who wants to you know, better their lives or or get over negative self-talk, imposter syndrome, depression, how, how can Mantastic benefit them? It, it provides you with a structure to follow until you can develop your own structure. That That's the best way I can describe it is when me, I knew I needed to change. I didn't know how. And Mantastic just provided me a structure to follow to begin with until I, until I had enough critical mass in regards to my own knowledge, my own self and all that sort of stuff to be able to build my own structure out. I think you've actually just summed it up so well. And if you haven't told Tommy what you just said, you should call him and tell him that, hey, I listen, I've, got, I've got the best breakdown for your entire business because I I don't think I could have put it a better way myself. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Listen, Tree, look, Thank it's you. been so, so great having you on the Identity Crisis podcast. Thank you for opening up and being so vulnerable and honest. Um, but your, your journey is incredible. And I really hope that for anybody who's listening out there who is going through any sort of depression or negative self-talk or lack of belief or whatever the case may be, I really hope that through listening to your journey and everything you've had to say inspires them to to make a change in their lives for the better in whichever way that might be. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a pleasure to be on and I really enjoyed sharing and yeah, it was fun. Oh, look, thank you very, very much. Look, Tree, you take care and thanks again. All right, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. And remember, it's only an identity crisis if you choose to make it one. It's okay to not be okay. So speak up and talk to someone or be the one that someone can turn to in their time of need. Don't forget to follow this podcast wherever you're listening. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show, send me an email at jnewtscomedy at gmail.com. I'm Jay Newts, and I'll see you next time.